Welcome to The Importance and Power of Reading. I'm Michelle, the computer lady, your host. During some awful dark times in America, black people were denied the ability to read, to learn how to read, to write, or to even own books. And that has hampered our communities up until this day. Now we're gonna have important conversations about the importance and power of reading. Hi everybody, welcome to today's new segment on the importance and power of reading. I'm Michelle Cavillo, your host. I have a dynamic young man. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Guess what he does? He's an educator, but he also runs gentle parenting. Now, everybody's confused about what gentle parenting is versus permissive parenting. But he's here today to share some of his insights and wisdom as we go over the journey about the importance of power of reading. Everybody, I want you to welcome my guest, Gabriel Hannans. Gabriel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Oh my God. I, I've been following you for a minute. I love the work that you do. Do us a favor. Tell everybody about you, where you live, and all this wonderful things or all the wonderful work you're performing right now. Oh, okay. That's a that's a very broad stroke. Uh, my name is Gabriel. I'm also known on social media as the indomitable black man. I live in Central Florida, uh, where it is currently 40 something degrees outside, so I'm not going out there. Um, I have a husky, relatively quiet. I am an educator. I work in um, public school, Volusia County Public Schools, as a seventh grade English language arts teacher. I have my undergrad degree in exceptional student education or special education, as a lot of people like to call it. I've worked as a registered behavioral technician for almost 10 years prior to teaching in education. And so now I am currently just working um, as an ELA teacher, trying to get kids excited about reading and writing and learning. That is absolutely amazing. Now, you have a newsletter, right? Can you tell folks about your newsletter a little bit? Absolutely. I have a, a newsletter with my business partner. It's called gentleparents.co, C-O. And it's a newsletter that goes out every single day. It's a five-minute read. It provides tips on how to apply gentle parenting tactics to your daily life in a very practical way. A lot of people are confused about what it is. They easily slide into permissive parenting, which everybody confuses with gentle parenting. And my my goal, my job is to educate parents, teachers, anybody who works with a child, what gentle parenting actually is. It is not letting kids get away with anything. It's teaching kids how to interact in any given situation, how to um, respond with effective communication, setting boundaries, modeling the behavior that you want to see, reinforcing the behaviors that you want to see, a whole litany of things. So that newsletter goes out every day straight to your email, five minute reads, just for you. I love it. So tell everybody, not only because, as you said, people get confused about gentle parenting versus permissive parenting. This is more about accountability. Am I correct? Uh, in, a, in a way, yes, 90% of it. Because, well, I've always had this really deep voice. And so my nieces and nephews, they're all grown now, but they were like, you know, you whooped this one. I say, I never whooped you. My voice is so strong, it carries, it penetrates. And so I don't have to whoop, I don't even have to yell. I never have. And that was the difference between me and a whole lot of folks. Mm -hmm. So I definitely understand the difference, but I want to make sure our parents understand the difference. And if they need help, we're going to ask you later to leave us all your information because we're going to post it down in the comment section for you YouTube uh, listeners so you can get information on how to reach Gabriel. So excited, so excited. Now, Gabriel, I've got a series of questions to ask you all about this reading journey. First off, how young were you when you started reading? Do you remember? Yes, I was two. You were two. So who was your major influencer? Was that mom? Was that dad? Was it both of them? Was it the village, grandma, siblings, aunts and uncles? Who brought you into this wonderful journey about reading? 
all of the above. I was born into a house of learners. My mom, she was going to school at Georgia State full time, raising two kids. I would always see her reading her college books all the time. We would be in her room, she'd be on her bed studying, we'd be watching TV. But seeing her reading, she also was teaching us to read. My sister was seven years older than me, so she was in school, so I'm always seeing her study. I'm a little kid growing up and seeing the same thing. Um, then when I moved to Florida, I was seeing my granddad always study. My granddad had a library. I have a lot of his books. He always read all the time. We're sitting down watching TV. He's reading and studying books. My grandma, same thing. My uncles, my aunts, same thing, reading and studying. So once, if you're in a house full of bibliophiles, you're going to pick that up. That's modeling behavior. A kid is going to pick that behavior up, think it's a normalcy, and do the same thing. So that's oh, pretty much my childhood. I, I, I totally agree. The reason I got to be reading at the age of two and a half and three was my mom was at home with me, but I also had four older brothers and my sister. My oldest sister, totally in the book, she gave me one of my first books. Oh, I love reading, and, and I love this whole journey. So to the Hannons, if you're watching your son out there, thank you for creating this wonderful man, this wonderful human being, and putting him on the path to reading. Now, let's talk about what was one of your favorite books as a child. Do you remember? Oh, God, yeah. So, okay, it was a few. Um, there's Goosebumps by R.L. Stein. Any Goosebumps book, specifically The Curse of the Mummy, that was my jam. Then anything by Edgar Allan Poe, specifically The Telltale Heart or The Fall of the House of Usher. Um, what else? Uh, the Blueford series. There was a book that I would read called The Bully, and then there was another one called The Gun. If y'all haven't read The Blueford series and you have a preteen or a teenager, get that book series. It's amazing, very relatable. And then I would say anything by like H.G. Wells. I really liked a lot of the uh, classics. Not, not too many. Alexander Dumas, he was pretty great. Um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was pretty cool. Uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. But science fiction and horror were my two biggest genres that I love. Wow. My mother would love you. She introduced me to Edgar Allan Poe, so I read that as a young person. Fall of the House of Usher, one of my favorites, Telltale Heart, and The Raven, of course. Then I, I did a lot of Alfred Hitchcock books, because he had mm -hmm. a young person series when I was growing up. You're talking about the 60s, so really, really great reads. Now, what are you reading today for fun, or what would you like to share for fun? Reading for fun, I don't really much read like fantasy or things for fun, but the last book I got that I was really trying to read as entertainment was a collection of Gothic black authors, or rather stories, Gothic stories written by black authors. There was W.E.B. Du Bois in there, I believe, but I left it at my church and then one of the kids picked it up and took it home and I have not seen that book since. So I'm gonna have to go find that child and make them give it back. Because uh, I wanted to read it and I haven't gotten it. Uh, but apart from that, I really, I really read to learn more now. Like if I showed y'all, I have like at least 20 books literally right here off stage or um, off camera that I just read through. Um, this book called The Talk, which I recommend, especially if you are uh, a person of color, it actually talks about um, it's a graphic novel, and it's talking about the talk that black and brown children get. If y'all know, y'all know. Um, that's actually here. It's a really good book. This was actually sent to me. And I don't really remember um, why it was sent, but it just came in my mail. This is Darren Bell. And it's really, really good. It's, it's a really good book. I recommend it. So that's, that's one of the biggest books that I would read. Uh, for entertainment or suggest that people read for entertainment, okay? All right, everybody. You know time flies here because we're having so much fun. We'll be right back with my guest, Gabriel Hannons, on The Importance of Power Reading. Everybody stay tuned. Since 1877, Jackson State University has been training students for a life of service and leadership to impact our global society. 
Ranked among the best HBCUs in the country, Jackson State University offers 47 undergraduate, 37 masters, one specialist, and 13 doctoral degree programs. Whether you're interested in the arts, education, public health, the sciences, or business, we're here to take you from ready to JSU ready. Visit jsums.edu and apply today. Hi, I'm Michelle the Computer Lady, author and children's book publisher of the Mommy Readers Collection series of books. Well, we know how important it is for us to read, but we also know how important our public hospitals are. We're here in Atlanta, my public hospital is Grady. They saved my life. And I would like to give back, and I need your help to do so. I've created a new fundraiser called Building Towards Our Future. And what's going to happen is we're going to make sure, you and I together, that Grady keeps on serving the marginalized, the poor, and the indigent in the Atlanta metro area. All right. Stay tuned for more announcements. I'm going to be telling you how real soon. Thank you for joining me in this fight to make sure that we can live with Grady. Welcome back, everyone. We're having a phenomenal discussion with this outstanding young man, Gabriel Hannans, as we talk about the importance and power of reading. Gabriel, we had a wonderful visit by your wonderful Husky. What's his name? His name is Prince Hercules Hannans. Awesome. He's beautiful. Thank you. Now, he's, uh, he's something. Well, look, we got our fur babies. You got to think about, you know, uh, tab time. She has her fur baby black, and he always getting into something. So that's the life of having a fur baby. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> so now I want to talk to you as an educator and a professional. How has reading helped you be successful in your career and your business? Whew. Um, one of the biggest things that my mom and my granddad instilled in all of their children, but definitely in me, is the idea of looking something up. If you don't know nothing, look it up. Anytime I needed, I would ask my mom, hey mom, what is this? Look it up. I don't think a lot of people understand the power of that because that I'm not going to just ask what I should be doing. I look it up. I research constantly. If you look at my phone, there's nothing but peer review articles, books that I've downloaded and I'm reading all over the place just because I can find something out. And because I have that drive to find something out and I know enough to read and read on a level to comprehend the information, I'm able to apply it everywhere. So when it comes to my professional life, college taught me a lot, but it did not teach me the nuances of education or how to teach or how to reach specific demographics of children. What did was learning by going through other places, other books, reading different authors, looking at different uh, studies, and then seeing how they work with their children. That's one of the biggest things that I've done to be successful in my career. Uh, when it comes down to my own business, businesses, I had to, because I'm not, I'm not business minded like that at all. Not, I don't think so. I have a business partner for that. But for everything else, I've had to go out of my way to research and learn what I can be doing to be more successful at it. So through reading, through understanding that, like my granddaddy always said, he said, if, so, uh, if you want to know something, somebody's written a book about it. And if they haven't written a book about it, write it. I will find a book that will tell me the information I need to know. And if I can't find it, I, you better believe I'm going to write it. So all my books right here, they're books on either behavior, books on social emotional understanding, books on literacy, books on classroom management, and everything in between. You're telling us that you're an author. Can you tell us some of the books that you've written or what you're writing right now? So I wrote one book. It's called This is Parenting, Demystifying Parenthood. That is the first book I wrote. That's the first book I published. Um, that, was, that was the journey. I uh, wrote it over about a span of three months. What I'm writing now is a book. Well, I'm writing technically two, but the first one is called God the Father, and it's helping people who are deconstructing or who are trying to understand their faith 
understand how a biblical way of parenting that is authoritative and not authoritarian, how uh, I guess the premise of it is a lot of people see God the way they see their parents. And if their parents are abusive and narcissistic, a lot of us will see God that way. And so the book is to try to show that the biblical way of raising their kids is not the same way that their parents raised them, that God operates differently. And then another book that I'm writing is a workbook slash journal that allows parents to help deal with themselves raising their children. So they're not raising their children and there's no help for them. I, I can teach you all day how to work with your kids, but what are you doing to help yourself? Are you practicing self-care? Are you practicing self-regulation? Are you being consistent? What tools do you need to be consistent? What did you do right when your child did this? What did you do wrong? What can you do differently next time? Just a way that you can put down your thoughts, but also track your journey uh, as being a gentle parent. I love it. I love it. Now, tell everybody where they can get your book. So if they need help parenting, because we've always said there's no books on, you know, there's no books to help us raise children, but there are. So where can get they get your book? So if you want to get This Is Parenting, which is the only book I have out right now, you can go check that out at The Book Patch. You can literally type in This Is Parenting, and my book will be the first book to come up. It'll say Leslie Hannons. Leslie is my first name. Please do not call me Leslie. But you'll see that first up there. That's my book. That is absolutely phenomenal and outstanding. So everybody, you can go and get his book if you're struggling as a parent. Guess what? He has the tools to help you become better. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Now, I've got this question to ask, because as an educator, what do you think the state of literacy is among our children, both small children, elementary, adolescent, and our adults? And if we're not where we should be at this point or at this juncture, what can we do to change the narrative? Okay, so here's the raw, raw truth. Most of the people in this country, in America, can only read to about a fourth to seventh grade level. So a lot of people are still learning to read and they have not gotten to the point where they're reading to learn. If anybody had seen one of the videos I posted, I had a lot of people tell me that it's the fault of the teacher why a lot of these kids can't read. And as much as we want to put it on one singular person, we cannot because Children cannot learn from one singular person. That's not how this works. When it comes down to literacy, specifically with reading, everything is sequential. We start off by learning the letters of the alphabet and their sounds. That's called phonemic and phonological awareness. That moves up to understanding things like grammar and language arts. That moves up to understanding how to read in its entirety. Once you get that down, which you are supposed to master in about elementary school, early elementary school, now you move into reading to learn. That's where you now take the information that you can read and being able to comprehend it, apply it in different areas, understand different things. I'm a seventh grade middle school teacher. I do not have the time to sit here and teach little Billy how to read. I cannot do that. Little Billy should already know how to read. Yes, they have eight hours in school a day. They're not spending eight hours reading one thing. They're not in reading class eight hours a day. There are other subjects they have to learn. They can pass in reading, but be failing in all these other classes. Now that works. That's across the board. That's that's boomers, that's Gen X, that's millennials, that's Gen Z, that's Gen Alpha. All of them have low reading levels. And those low reading levels contribute to things like maladaptive behavior. That contributes to things like mass incarceration. That includes things like domestic abuse. When you start to see how literacy affects every area of your life, effective communication is why fights exist. Once you learn effective communication and how to express your thoughts, you'd be surprised how much miscommunication can be ended just, just by that. But now, what we need to do as a way to correct it, first thing we need to be doing is starting early. When these, if you're reading, even if you're reading a magazine, you're modeling that to a child. If you're reading, if you're even thumbing through something small, they're looking at the behavior of you looking intently at something and they want to know what's, what's going on. Then those kids, even if they're babies, they're going to start mimicking what you're doing. They may not know what's on the page, but they're mimicking what you're doing as, you as they continue to uh, grow up 
and you're work, uh, you're reading something, start teaching them what certain letters and certain words make, what they mean. They'll start to get it. They'll start to get it quick. You just build on that. By the time they get into Head Start or Pre-K, they're already where they should be, if not farther. I've been reading on a college level since like third grade. Anybody can do it unless there's like a disability. But even with things like dyslexia, there's so many resources that are available even at the home. Orton Gillingham is a great thing to use. Uh, Hooked on Phonics, great thing to use. I taught a girl who had dyslexia how to read through Orton Gillingham. We can do it. We have to take the time to do it. And I know parents can be tired. I know parents can be stressed. I know parents sometimes just don't want to do it or may not be able to do it because they can't read themselves. Baby, if you can read a basic book, that's more than your child can. Go ahead and read that basic book to them. That, that's really what it looks like because we need to be working in tandem with teachers. We cannot do it all alone. We should not be, have to do it all alone. We don't get that paid that much. We work together. Your children will thrive. I, I guarantee it. I guarantee, unless there is a neurological disorder, you start with your children younger, they will get to where they need to be, if not farther, by the time they get to uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, they will thrive. They will thrive. I promise you they will thrive. You are absolutely correct. We can't say it enough. The quicker, the more you introduce our children at a younger age, the better their chances at being successful on this reading journey. So thank you so much for that. Now, as you know, time flies quickly here. We've got to take another commercial break, but we're going to be back with the indomitable black man, AKA Gabriel Hannans, as we keep exploring the importance of power of reading. Everybody stay tuned. Are you a company, business, or service that believes in social responsibility? Would you like to make a positive impact? You can. You can sponsor this program and be seen by 2 million viewers on the PIC TV network. Call 770-367-1268 for more information today. Welcome back to the importance of power of reading. I can't say enough about this black man, the indomitable black man, a.k.a. Gabriel Hannans. He's blessing us with so much great information about the importance and power of reading. Gabriel, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just blessed by your presence. I'm blessed by the work that you're doing, especially teaching people how to gentle parent. Now. I've got four brothers and, and you're a guy and you know you can speak to men. What I'd like to know is how can we help our black young men read more? Because I find that with a lot of guys, especially with my brothers, they always want to go out and play. They want to do everything besides sit home and, and read. So what can we do to push our, our boys to read more? Absolutely. <sighs> Get them books that they want to read. A lot of us, and this is what I try to tell a lot of my um, black students. You, it's not that you don't like reading. You don't have something that's interesting enough that's going to draw you in. Of course you want to play. We're very athletic, mobile kids. Like that's, that's what we do. But then there's also books that can still get you excited. There are books about sports. There are books about um, black boys love to flip. Black boys love to flip. There are books about black gymnasts that flip. There are books that any kid would want to read. You just have to find it. Going to a library, getting these men to go to the library, finding a book that could interest them, finding a book about their favorite athlete, finding a book about their favorite artist, finding a book about pick something. It's about getting them to a place where they can sit down and read something they want to read. That includes comics. That includes magazines. That includes the even a news article. Something that 
is liter um, literature, something that is, is, is text. Get them to read that. It's, they want to, there's something there if they think it's interesting. I have a student right now, he loves the Eagles. I would give him anything pertaining to the team of the Eagles and he would want to read it. I have another kid, he wants to be a rapper. Great, write me a rap. Write me a rap song. Let's look at figurative language. Let's look at wordplay. Let's look at some of the greats. Let's look at most depth. Let's look at Nas. Let's look at, you know, Jay-Z. Let's see how they worded their things in there. When I teach figurative language to my students, we look at rap artists. We, put, um, we looked at Michael Jackson's uh, Human Nature. We looked at Lil Wayne's six foot, seven foot. We identified where there were similes, metaphors, personifications, hyperboles, all in there. And they were engaged because it's interesting to them. Raw wave, put on some raw wave. What is he talking about right here? Can you make something similar? It's, it's getting them interested. It's, it's finding a way to make the literature interesting to them. Shakespeare was cool back then to people who could relate to the language. It is 2024. We can find literature. We can find stuff that these kids will want to listen to and make sense of it in the context of who they are now and it be engaging, especially to these black kids. That's all you got to do. I love it. I totally agree. The more we give them the, the things that they really love, the more we model, the more that they can mimic us, and I love the fact that you're like, hey, if they're listening to rap, let's go look at the lyrics. Those are words. They're written words. The indomitable black man strikes again. Now, as you know, I'm a lover of STEM. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tech person. And STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. How can we get our kids to gravitate more towards those subjects to be successful in those areas? Do you have some suggestions for parents? So fun fact, before I switched my major to exceptional student education, my major was biomedical sciences. And I was in this, yeah, yeah, I was doing that. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go into oncology and infectious disease research for my entire life. And it was number God to switch me up. But one of the best things to do for teaching or for getting kids to start navigating towards STEM is to show them the application of it early on, instead of just sitting down and lecturing. Yes, lectures are great, it's cool, awesome. Get their hands in it, get their hands in it. Because when they're doing that, that's the best. They want to know, they, they want to play, they want, they want to be tactile, they want to see why is this doing this. I would rather you learn through experimenting and messing something up than to sit there and just listen to something over and over again about how something works. That's not gonna help me too much. What, I want to see how it works. You do something like that, that's going to push kids towards that direction. Inevitably. You're exactly right. Which is why I started writing books, STEM books for kids. Because I know when our children see these types of books, these things get them interested. When they see the picture books and they're like, oh, mommy, I see a black doctor. Or, you know, I see a doctor that's doing this. Or I see a scientist that's doing this. Or I see this mathematician. I didn't know we could be mathematicians. It's all these tools to draw our children in. So thank you so much for that, Gabriel. Now, I need to ask you, can you give parents of boy, boys and girls ways that they can get their kids reading? even if it's five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, and how they can engage their children on this journey. Because we, as you said, we need the parents to be partners with us on this reading mm -hmm. journey. Yes, so the first thing you can do is just find things that they're interested in to read. You can ask them to read things if you're driving in a car. What does that sign say? You can't, being, working with children, you have to be creative. You have, you have to be creative and you have to be innovative. You have to think of ways that you can reach your kids. My mom would sit here and ask me what my timetables were while we're driving around the city. She would ask me to read certain things while we're riding around the city. If we're going to a grocery store, what does this ingredient say? If we're cooking something in the kitchen, what does this recipe call for? Read this recipe to me. It's small stuff like that that helps these kids get to a higher level of literacy. 
but then there's also that explicit reading. That was natural environment reading. Now let's do some explicit reading. Let's sit down here. Let's read this book together. Let's see what's going on. Having a family book club. Yes, yes, it is going to be time consuming. I know. I promise I do. You got two and three jobs. You got three or four kids. You got all the stuff you got to do the house. You got to take the time. You got to make the time. Sit down with them. Read something together. Even if it's the Bible and y'all do that with your family. If you want to read the Quran, if you want to read the Dhammapada, whatever you want to read, if you want to just pick a book from the library, whatever. The reading, finding the time to explicitly read and ask them questions about what they're reading, that's going to boost them up. And that's the easiest way to do it. And it can be something as simple as 30 minutes a day. You're absolutely correct. Now, Gabriel, you've given us some really salient points on ways that we can get our kids reading. Because even before you said, Hey, take these young black men and take these young black women to the library. On that, how important is having books in the home for children to read? <laughs> if you don't have a book in a house, how are they going to read it? How are they going to normalize literacy? How are they going to normalize reading? They're going to go to their phone. They're going to go to a screen. They're not going to have it. This is the craziest thing. And I'm sorry, I have ADHD. A lot of kids don't have imaginations nowadays. They don't have imagination. Like, it's like pulling teeth to get my students to write a creative writing assignment. And that's my advanced class. Because they're not normalizing reading, fantasy, reading anything, unless it's like Diary of a Wimpy Kid. That's not really fantasy. That's about a kid's life or dog, man. They're not reading fantasy books. They're not reading books that evoke imagination. If you want them to have those things that make kids kids, you have to give them the tools in order to do it. Give them materials to do it. They should be reading things like Edgar Allan Poe. They should be reading things like Charles, well, maybe not Charles Dickens. He was born. Um, H.G. Wells, or even if you want to do something small, V for Vendetta. Well, high school kids, V for Vendetta. Goosebumps. Goosebumps is good. I'd say Goosebumps. Animorphs, those are books that I read when I was a kid, and they foster an imagination. Graphic novels, Power Rank, there's so much to... Manga, manga is good. If you got a kid that likes anime, get them the manga of the anime, and they will read it, but they need to have books. If you don't have a book in the house, you're not normalizing what it is to read. They're going to go to their phone, they're going to go to a tablet, they're going to go to a TV, and you will not see them, but they're also losing that imagination. They're having dopamine shoved in their faces, they're not getting any type of good explicit reading from a book, a, a physical book. But I mean, also ebooks are good, I guess. Well, my thing is, and you talk about explicit reading, just break that down for parents that might not understand what that means. Explicit reading is when you're sitting down with a child and you're specifically reading that book for the purposes of teaching, instructing, practicing, so there's natural environment reading where I'm asking you to read a recipe because we're cooking. That's one thing. Or reading a sign because we're just driving past. But then explicit reading is when you're sitting down and we're reading because we're trying to learn something about the text itself. So that's the difference between natural environment and explicit. Gabriel, you have blessed our soul. As you know, this time goes by real fast. I want you to tell everybody where they can get your book again and all your social media platforms that you're on and if they need to reach you the information will be right down here go all right so if you want to find me you can find me on all social well the three main social media platforms that i'm on um instagram TikTok, and youtube all under the underscore indomitable underscore black man um, i have some fakes out there that are trying to copy me, but those are the primary ones. Uh, if you want to find my book, once again, it's at The Book Patch. You can type in This Is Parenting, and my book will be the first book to come up. It's under Leslie Hannons. If you see the last name, that's me. That is absolutely phenomenal. Everybody, if you're not following this man on TikTok, Instagram, all the socials, you should. Every day, he's giving great advice. He's an educator and a professional, and he's here to help our kids. Thank you so much for blessing us with this interview today. 
I look forward to working with you. You're exciting and you're doing so much to uplift our community. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you. So parents, you've heard it from an educator, a teacher. We need to start early. We need to make sure that our kids are reading early. We need to introduce them to books early, whether you take them to the library, whether you have books in the home, but make sure that you're modeling so they can see what you're doing. This way, we make them successful and they know about the importance and power of reading. We'll see you next week. Thanks so much for stopping by. You know what's going on in our society, book banning, and over 38 million children don't have books in their homes. Join me for some exciting segments as we talk about the importance and power of reading with my guest, Dr. J. Jordan Henley. I am Black History. As I bring authors, doctors, teachers, administrators, entrepreneurs, people in multiple occupations on my show so our children can see the importance of representation of today's Black history. I am Black history, and I am Michelle, the computer lady. Join me on my show, The Importance and Power of Reading, every week as I bring new faces to teach you the importance and power of reading and to show you Black history. I am Black history. They are Black history. Go watch them now on the Pick TV Network, Channel 1000.